So, good morning everyone and welcome to this webinar. My name is Bjorn Skjönberg. I work as FIE here at KnowHow. And this is session two. So, trace your embedded system using Lauterbach trace functionality. Um, let me see. Okay, so this is a webinar series in three. Uh, yesterday, I talked about what you need to get started. So what Lauterbach software, what Lauterbach hardware you need, and also what you need to have um, loaded to your targets to get started with debugging. And then I showed you what you can do with basic uh, debugging. So if you only have the JTAG signals available, um, this webinar is on YouTube, so if you wish, you can have a look at it again on our Know How Solutions channel. Today, I will show you what you can do with Trace. So, if you have some way of collecting Trace data from your target, so what type of performance measurement you can get, what type of code coverage you can get, and also the code coverage reports that are available, um, cache analysis to see how well your cache is performing, and then the context tracking system, which is debugging your trace data backwards. Tomorrow, I will talk about how to use Lauterbach in your continuous integration, so how you can add Lauterbach to your software or component tests, and what reports you can get out of adding Lauterbach. Also, a little bit of how to set up the test automation and what APIs are available. So, I'm using the same target as yesterday, so I have my Panda board with Linux. It's an SMP system, so it has a dual Cortex-A9s. I am using the Mictor 38, 38 trace connector to get off-ship trace from my target. So, as you can see to the right, we have the pinout for my Mictor. Um, so I'm, have, I'm having 16 trace data lines um, to get the, the instruction traced out of my target. I have also something called the embedded trace buffer, which is an on-chip memory on my target where I can store trace. Um, and I'm using the PTM, so the program trace microcell, to get trace from my target. I will talk a little bit more in a few slides about this. And then again, I'm using Linux 3.1.2. So, my hardware setup. Well, I have my power debugger, as I had yesterday, and I have my ARM-specific debug cable, as I had yesterday as well. To this, I have connected the Lauterbach Power Trace 2. And this is generic trace, so it will work for every architecture. Uh, mine has one gigabyte of internal memory, but you can get to up to four gigabyte of memory. Um, to my PowerTrace 2, I have a preprocessor connected. So this preprocessor is ARM specific. So for every architecture, for PowerPC or some other architecture, you need uh, architecture specific preprocessor. So with the Power Trace 2, I can get function runtime measurement both on task level and on function level because my Lauterbach is aware that I'm debugging a Linux kernel. I can get performance analysis, so performance numbers out of my trace. I can get uh, the context tracking system, the cache analysis, CPU stalls, code coverage, um, and then also code coverage reports. And then I will end by talking a little bit of trace filtering. So normally you're not interested in everything. You're probably interested in some application or some function that you have written. So a little bit of how you can reduce the amount of trace data. So if we, let's talk about trace. So for my core, for my Cortex A9, I'm using a programmer program trace macro cell, the PTM, which is part of the ARM IP. So every Cortex A core has such a ARM IP block. So this is responsible for 
providing the trace connector with trace data. So this PTM is non-intrusive. So this will not affect the real time uh, of my target. So if you have another architecture, you will have a similar block that will do the same service for you. So what you need to look up yourself is to see, do we have the pins taken from the PTM to a trace connector? Um, and if you have that, you can use the off-ship trace, which I'm using today. So I'm exporting trace with my Lauterbach tr power trace. If you don't have a trace connector that has the trace pins, um, you can use the on-ship trace if you have such. So this is the ETB, the embedded trace buffer. So this is usually between 4 and 8K large. And you only need the debug cable with a trace license to read this buffer. <coughs> Downside of having the ETB is that you can't export the trace while the target is running. Um, so you will get very limited uh, amount of trace. We will have a look at that later on. Also, you can't check if your trace buffer is full. Um, so also with the trace, it's possible to export the trace content for later analysis. So what I mean by this is that if you collect your trace and you save your trace to your hard drive, you can always share this trace data with your coworkers, and the, your coworker can then load the trace data into Trace32 software in simulation mode, and then get the exactly the same results as you've seen when you are connected to the target. So all the measurements I'm doing, it's on the trace buffer. So it's not really, once I have the trace, it's not really important if I have the target connected or not anymore. Um, so for technical questions, please contact me, Bjorn Skjönberg, or if you have any sales questions, please contact one of my um, co-workers. Okay, so let's go into the technical part. So I'm running at the moment with my Linux, and you see here we have Linux 3.1.2 and I'm up and running. So I've put up the trace window where I'm collecting trace. So as you can see, the trace is not being collected very quickly at the moment because I have no application running on target, so therefore not much is happening. And uh, there are three modes we need to know about uh, when collecting trace. So we have the FIFO mode, which is first in, first out. So when the buffer is full, you will erase the oldest package and then continue to collect. We can have something called stack mode. So Lauterbach will collect the trace data until the trace buffer is full and then target will continue to run but you have no um, collecting of the trace data. And we have the stream mode. So stream mode means that we are streaming trace data from our target to our Lauterbach trace hardware and then from Lauterbach trace hardware to our host. So we, with this we can get unlimited size of, of trace data. Okay, so I will load a script which will load an application for me, put some breakpoints and then give me a nice little trace buffer to work with and then I will start showing what you can get. So I use my Custom main menu, trace, trace all. I will start the application called link. So there we go. So now we see um, there has been some breakpoints and we have a small trace buffer collected for us. So I also added two buttons because I like to have my windows in a certain way when I do trace. So if I click the trace perspective, ah, wrong screen, the um, trace will come up like this. So here we see for core number zero, so what core number zero has been up to, and here we see for 
core number one, so what core number one has been up to. And then I'm and if I'm clicking in one of the windows, all of the other threes will be updated due to this track option. So I always know what each core was doing at each time. So when core number one was doing Echoes O. 08, we know that core number 0 was in default idle. And we can also see what instruction we're executing at this time. So if we have a little bit look, so we can say more, so we see all of the instructions. Or we can say less, and we will see less and less up to the only high-level code execution. So the TI back means how long it took from this instruction to this instruction to be executed, and it was 0.66 microseconds. So we can also, so we also see how the functions are calling each other. So which function call which, and then we can zoom in to get more the details of how it's actually calling each other. We can also get the same view but in performance numbers so where have we spent most of our time so let's say show numerical so this will show me a total view of core number zero and core number one and I know that my application was executing on core number one so for me it would be more interesting to just have a look at core number one. So I will right click and then I will say core number one and then we say config and internal ratio. So we see here that we have spent quite so much time in speed trouble, 44% of core number one's execution time for this trace buffer. Uh, so we get a pretty good overview for minimum maximum time and then average of how long it took. So if we have a look at, let's say, this function common, so we see that common has been called five times, so it would be useful for us to know who has called the function common. So if I right click and I say linkage, I get a list of which function has called common. Um, so it's x echoes two times, and then the root, and then these two functions. So these are our five function calls to common. Then it could also be interesting to know at what frequency or what periodicity has common been called. So if we have a look in our trace list, then I would like to find the first instruction of common when it was executed. So I will search for the function common, and I will say find all. So here we get the the, the all of the calls to common and we see here TI back so we see with width uh, how long it took between this call and this call. So this gives you quite good overview of how how the calling tree uh, is is looking. So we can also have a look at the MIPS, so how many instructions has been executed. So if I click MIPS here, and let's say we will look for both core number 0 and core number 1. We go here and we see this is the, the peak. Uh, can I zoom in more? Yes, I can. So we see here we have a peak of about 760 MIPS. <coughs> I know my, my Panda board is running at 1 gigahertz, and I have two Cortex-A9. So th they can do 5,000 MIPS. So I've only um, used about 8 or 9% of the total CPU load. So there's quite much functionality which I can add to my system. So in this way, it's quite good um, to measure this. So I know for a certainty that it will be okay to load more functionality. 
Okay, so let's have a look at the context tracking system. So we say win page reset and we say trace CTS. So I will start by turning the CTS on. So the CTS is reconstructing the flow of the CPU. So this is typical if you want to step your trace buffer backwards you can do this with CTS and you can see how let's say for different variables are being updated. So I have also done a perspective for CTS which is for some reason showing on my other screen. So as you see now the buttons here are yellow and we have the backwards as well so this means we can start to step our code backwards. So I will give you a quite simple example. I will show you how Lecter goes from 0 to 1 just so you can get the ID of, of how the CTS is working. I have my registers, so these are reconstructed, uh, and I have my trace data for core number one where the application was executed. So just to highlight that there is no reconstructing going on on the target, this is strictly happening on the host. So if we step backwards here, so let's have a look and see how Lecter goes from 0 to 1. So first of all, we will load the address of Lecter, where it is. So this is a two instruction mechanism. So I load to R3 these two values. So we see here R3 is being updated. R3 becomes this. Then we load the value into R3 to where R3 is pointing. So let's see where R3 is pointing. So if we have the indirect dump, we see that R3 is pointing to this. So this is a reconstruction of the memory at this time. So we will load 0 into R3. Here we go. We will add the value of R3 with 1 and then we will store it in R2 step and then we will load again the address of lector. This is again a two instruction mechanism. So 1, 2 and then we will store the value of R2 to where R3 is pointing and this is where lector goes from from 0 from 0 to 1. So when I step this instruction Lecter will become 1 and the data dump will also become 1. So quite simple example but just for you to get the idea of what you can do with the context tracking system. So debugging backwards is now possible. So let's have a look at the cache analysis. So first of all we need to click cache and we need to process the cache. So this usually takes a few seconds. So now we're done. So if we have a look at the results, let me just close some windows first. So this is the general result of the cache for the branch prediction and for the stalls. So this is the general result of the complete, of the trace buffer which we have collected. So we get instruction cache, data cache, and level 2 cache. Um, but it, I mean, this would be more interesting if I know, for instance, for each line, how much hit and miss do we have. So this is actually possible to get. So... <coughs> If I go ahead and say cts.cache and we would like to have a look at list line and let's say instruction cache. The function I want to look at is speed trouble. So this usually takes 10, 15, 20 seconds to calculate the cache performance of um, of the speed trouble. So there we go. So now we get a little bit more detailed overview of how the cache is doing. So if I have a look at this line I see 
I have one miss and 11 hits. So if we double click this line, it will take me to the data list of speed trouble. And we can see for each instruction, how many hits and how many misses do we have. So this will give a quite good overview of how your function or your application is doing. So which, which, which line of code is causing the slowdown in performance. So this is quite good to, to overview. Okay, enough about this. We will, I will clear the window again and we say CTS off. <clears throat> so let's have a look at the code coverage module in Trace32. So it's located here. So before we can use it, we need to add our trace buffer to the code coverage module. So this means that we can add multiple trace buffers to the same, um, to the code coverage module and then look at the complete result, so to say. Um, so I will talk more about this tomorrow. So if you do like component tests and you have individual test cases, you can add all of your trace buffers into one big uh, code coverage result. So I will add my trace buffer and then I will say um, list functions. So let's have a look at the application code down here. So we see here we have for instance function common. We have 76% of coverage for this function. So if I double click I will again get to the data list window and I can see which functions that are okay, so which function has been executed. I've seen which function that has been taken. So it means that this function this instruction has been taken but never executed but never true, sorry. So I has never been equal to 10. And then you see what instructions that has never been taken. So they have never been executed. This is possible to get as well in the XML report. So this is from a different project, but just to give you an idea what you can get. So I will get the total code coverage. So I have 73% here. And then we can have a look. So it's a function called Wooten. And then we can go and say, have a look here. So this is the data list window of, of this function. So we can again see which high level code has been executed and which ones that has not been executed. So this is possible to get in an XML report and anyone in your company can open this XML report so you can share this to your whole organization. The only thing needed is an XSL file which is provided by Lauterbach. So this you don't need to take care of. So this gives a quite good overview of um, what has been executed and what has not been executed. Okay, so let me give you a few words on trace filtering. So I will start. Ah, I have a breakpoint. Ah, okay. So if we go Ah, there we go. Okay, so I will just load some more applications to my system to get a little bit more interesting. So if we have a look at the trace. So if I say remove the buffer, you will see that the trace will fill up quite quickly. Um, this is because there's quite a lot happening now. I've loaded some new applications. So how can you save the trace buffer? Um, so you can save the trace buffer, so to speak, by setting filter points. So I have a script that will set filter points for me. So if we have a look in the break.list, I will do 
a script, so context switch filter. So this will set up breakpoints for me in these functions. So a trace filtering point and a breakpoint is more or less the same. However, the action that Lauterbach will perform once this line of code is being hit is quite different. So when I have a breakpoint, I have that the action should, should be stop. So I would like to stop the execution. Here, I would like that Lauterbach will turn trace on. And then when I hit this line of code, I will say trace turn off. So you can either do these for only applications. So if you just interested in some function, set the start point and a stop point right before and after. Or in my case, which I'm looking at right now, I'm only interested in when the context switches are happening between the different tasks. So I'm only interested in this. So when I start executing my target, you see that the trace buffer will fill up quite slowly and I can probably have a few hours of trace when I have these filters in. So if we break the execution and we have a look at the performance again, so we can have a look at the task runtime. So we can either say show numerical, so both for core number one and core number zero, let me just sort it, we see how much of each function has spent. Um, so this is quite good to see how the execution was. And then of course we can get the same type of view that I had before with the chart view. So how the different, different applications are calling each other. So on core number one, W3 was executed and then W2 was running at the same time in core number zero. And I can of course split this to core number zero and core number one for separate windows. So this is all I had to say. So all of the trace measurement I've done today, I have done on the trace buffer. So as long as I have the trace buffer, I can always do this measurement. So I don't need really to have the target connected. Tomorrow, I will show you how you can use Lauterbach in continuous integration and what type of reports you can gain from adding Lauterbach. I will give you an idea of how to do it and what APIs that are pre-made uh, from Lauterbach. Um, so thank you all for listening. I will unmute you all uh, and please feel free to ask any questions.